So what are the benefits of using compression in a database system? Well, you might think of one of the reasons for that, that is less storage space. That's kind of the thing you usually already know about. You use that on file systems already. So here the compression goal is to spend less storage space to be able to put more data on a specific device. But that's not the most important reason in database systems for using compression. The major reason for using compression is bandwidth. So what we want to have is, we want to have less bandwidth in query processing. So we use compression in order to improve query processing times. This sounds like conflicting goals, but actually this is possible if compression is applied in the right way. So let's look at some examples. Let's assume the following example. You scan something from disk and then you do some query processing on the file you're scanning. So assume a large sequential scan of one gigabyte of uncompressed data. Let's assume we have a 100 megabyte sequential read bandwidth, so something like a single disk we're reading from. So this means we need 10 seconds to read that file, 10 seconds. And the entire process is very likely to be IO bound. So the CPU will be idling most of the time. So assume we filter out some data from that file that, that won't count too much, that won't block the process. This is a strictly I.O. bound process. I.O. bound in the sense of this is a bottleneck. The disk is a bottleneck, slowing down all of the processing. So let's assume further that we have a three gigahertz CPU and assume that reading from disk and CPU overlaps. With overlap, I mean, it's not like this that you have yeah, and no overlap. It would be something like, okay, you read from disk, you read it into memory first in the first phase. And then in the second phase, the CPU kicks in and does all the processing. Yeah, that would be no overlap. And of course, CPU and IO operations overlap usually, or you should program in a way that, that they overlap. So what this means is these two phases overlap. Reading from disk, this is phase one, overlaps with the CPU computation. So the first data that is read is already fed into the CPU, so the CPU can start processing. So here there's a little latency, a little delay at the beginning, but then the CPU can start processing. So these two things overlap. The read, I'll write it down again. So the read from disk and the CPU computation. And with that, of course, you have a lower, you have a smaller end-to-end -end time. Yeah? Rather than adding one plus two, which gives you the end-to-end -end time, here it's dominated by the read costs. And that's exactly the situation we are seeing here the entire process is I.O. bound in the sense the disk is a bottleneck. So what this means is we have basically 30 clock ticks to burn for every single uncompressed byte in the input. How do I get to that number? Well, very easy. We have 10 seconds of CPU time. So this means we have 10 times 3, which is 30 billion clock ticks to spend while reading that file. So if we do the math, this means we have 30 clock ticks for each single byte, for every single byte, uncompressed byte in the input to burn. That is what the CPU is allowed to do. So only if we spend more clock ticks per byte, the entire process becomes CPU bound again. So only if, a, if you have a process running that spends more than 30 clock ticks per, per uncompressed byte, then the entire process will become CPU bound again. But as long as this is smaller equal 30 clock ticks, it's I.O. bound. Okay, so let's compress the data. Let's assume we achieve a compression ratio of 1 to 4, which means now the file is only 0 0.25 gigabytes. So this means we can read the file way faster, 2.5 seconds only rather than 10 seconds for the uncompressed data. So factor we are by factor four faster for reading that specific file. That is great, of course. And let's look at the clock ticks again. Now we only have 2.5 seconds of CPU, which means we have 7.5 billion clock ticks to burn. Um, so if we divide it again, against the input, so 7.5 billion clock ticks divided by the input file size, 0 0.25 gigabytes. So this means we can spend 30 clock ticks to uncompress and process for each compressed byte. 
you know, what's the difference to what we had before? Before we had the 30 clock ticks for each uncompressed byte. Now we have the 30 clock ticks for every compressed byte. So if we go back to the uncompressed bytes again, we have to divide by four again, which means we have 7.5 clock ticks per uncompressed byte. Before we had 30 in the uncompressed data. That's a major difference to the example before. So let's go back. Here, here we see it. We had 30 clock ticks to burn for every uncompressed byte. And that's now changed because we compress the file using a compression ratio of four. So here we are. So assume query processing works on the uncompressed data only. You really need to uncompress it while reading. So as long as you're using uh, less than 30 or up to 30 clock ticks, you will still be I.O. bound. You could even use more clock ticks in this scenario and then become CPU bound. But still, in summary, you might be faster than the 10 seconds. Yeah? If you increase this from 30 clock ticks to 40 clock ticks, let's do the math. If you use 40 clock ticks for every compressed byte, so 40 clock ticks, uh, 250 million bytes, which means we have to spend 10 billion, 10 billion clock ticks, 10 billion, 10G clock ticks. So this means, so how long does it take to spend those clock ticks? Well, it's a little above, um, so let's divide it by three. So 10 divided by three divided by three is something like um, three dot three seconds. So it's a little above three seconds. So even that would be faster. So even if you spent 40 clock ticks, we would be faster. So if you want to compress in a way that your CPU bound, that's, that's also fine in the scenario. So as long as the CPU cycles you're burning doesn't exceed the the 10 seconds we had for the uncompressed data, you will be faster. So it's important to pick the compression method in the right way, that you're not overloading the CPU and slowing down the I.O. operation. So what we want to do is we want to design a compression method in a way or we want to pick the right compression method such that I.O. becomes faster. And this does not only apply for reading data from disk, this also applies in main memory. So here, let's change the constants a little bit. Again, assume a one gigabyte scan of uncompressed data, but here we have a way higher bandwidth. Let's assume 100 times faster than scanning from disk. So we are 100 times faster, not 10 seconds, but 0 0.1 seconds read time. So this means if we still have the same CPU, like three gigahertz, with full overlap, so we only have 0 0.3 clock ticks to burn for every single uncompressed byte in the input. And that changes the numbers a lot. And here we have to be really careful which compression method to use. So assume again we have a, the same compression ratio, let's say a factor 4. We only need 25 milliseconds read time, reading it from main memory. We have factor four faster than on the uncompressed data for reading. And then you have to be a little careful. So because we only have 0 0.075 billion clock ticks, 75 million clock ticks to burn. So this is in total, this is in total the number for while reading this from DRAM. So on average, we only have 0 0.3 clock ticks to uncompress and process for each compressed byte. So this boils down to 0 0.075 clock ticks per uncompressed byte. So here you already have to be very careful in picking the right method. So um, still, there are methods that do exactly that. And sometimes methods are as easy as picking the right domain, picking the, the right type for a specific attribute value. And we will look at that in the following videos in detail. What we will be talking about is called lightweight compression. And lightweight has this goal that decompression time or the decompression costs, this is the CPU costs, yeah, that's the CPU costs. Plus the costs for reading the compressed data, which is some form of I.O. This is some read I.O. This may be from disk, may be from main memory, may be from the network. So this may be any memory bus. And the sum of those costs should be smaller than reading the uncompressed data.
Now that is reading the uncompressed data. So reading the uncompressed. And in processes where, where this is a bottleneck, where I always a bottleneck as reading the uncompressed data or transferring the uncompressed data as a problem, then you can think about this equation. And we will look at variants of that. Of course, you can also do that for write operations if you want. You can say, okay, what the heck? You say, I replace that with write. I replace that with write. And I don't care about the decompression. I care about the compression. And then the same equation applies. Compression plus write, smaller equal write here. Huh? So compressing the data plus writing the compressed data should be smaller equal writing the uncompressed data. This equation not only applies to data management, but it applies in any situation in computer systems and computer science when you want to transfer data over a wire, over a bus. And in the material, I will also link to a list of different bus systems and computer systems where this equation applies. So in all these systems, in all these situations, you can exploit that. So what we need for a method is that it should be CPU friendly. Now, if the CPU costs are too high, of course, the left side will become bigger than the right side. That's not what we want to have. So we, sh in, in, so we should be careful in picking the right method. Of course, this depends on the specific hardware you're using. If you uh, have 100 different CPU cores available for decompression, then you might even use a very heavy, a very expensive method here. It's also worth looking at the specific system. What, how much CPU do you have available for decompression or compression? And another twist here is, so usually those methods are lossless. That would be very risky to use a lossy method if you get a different uh, value back in decompression than, you, than the one you compressed. That might lead to problems. So you might think that this shouldn't be used, but actually there are some index structures that also work with lossy compression. The art here is that you fix it afterwards. So for if you use lossy compression, you have to be careful because you want to have the right result. Eventually, you have to go to the, the uncompressed correct value. If the lossy decompression just gives you an approximation, still eventually you have to get to the right values. So for these methods, in the first step, you will be using a lossy decompression. But then for the candidates where you feel like they're interesting, then you need to look at the really the uncompressed, uh, the real values, um, precise values. Yeah. The bottom line for the moment is just to say for these, for the compression we will be using, it would be too strict to say that we only look at lossless compression. We can also look at lossy compression. However, if you do that, if you factor in lossy compression, you have to be careful, of course, the system should eventually return the right result. So finally, uh, it's important to understand about the compression granularity. So granularity means what is the object we're actually compressing or decompressing. So we might compress or decompress individual attribute values. That's one way of compressing. But we could also compress larger granules like entire tuples or pages. Assume that the page collects many, many tuples, so why not compress the entire page? Alternatively, we could also compress an entire horizontal partition of a table. Now, let's assume that such a horizontal partition contains many, many pages. Now, so I'm always getting bigger here. The granule gets bigger the more I go down here. So we could also compress entire tables or we compress entire databases. Well, and there's, a, there's an important trade-off to keep in mind here that is accessibility versus compression ratio. So if you look at accessibility, and accessibility here means, so what is the smallest granule I can access in my compressed data? Then you have a relationship like that. So assume you compress the entire database. And in order to access the data, you have to uncompress the entire database. Well, that's, that's very, very costly and it's, in terms of accessibility, not a very nice thing because assume you're only interested in a specific tuple. However, you compress the entire database, then this boils down to, in order to access a single tuple, you have to uncompress the entire database. Well, that's not so great, right? 
So you have to worry a little bit about what is the, the, the granule of access that, that you want to support in, during query processing. So a more realistic scenario could be tables. You say, okay, I compress each table one by one, but then the method still, if you use an individual tuple, if you're interested in one tuple of the table, you have to uncompress the entire table, which triggers a lot of work. So maybe that already is too much of work. So you have to find the sweet spot here. The best, of course, is to compress individual attribute values However, if you do that, you're going to lose in terms of compression ratio. This has the op opposite behavior as accessibility because it looks like this. So the smaller the granule you're compressing on, the lower the compression ratio. So in, for most methods, it's a good choice to grab big chunks of data, to, to grab an entire page for compression or even better, an entire horizontal partition. That's gives you a nice compression ratio. So this is the trade-off you, you, we are playing with. We have to make a decision here. And there's no single point of truth here. It depends a lot on the workloads you want to support. It depends on your data, on the data distribution, stuff like that. So we, usually we try to pick methods here. It's, it's very rare that we, we go to one extreme. So even compressing entire tables or databases is rare. Compressing individual attribute values is somewhat more likely than compressing databases. So everything in that space, attribute values, tuples, pages, horizontal partitions, are very likely methods to use in a database system. And how that works in detail, we will look at in the following videos. If you liked this video, don't forget to hit the like button. Thank you. So if you want to see more database videos, be it in English or in German, take a look at my website datenbankenlernen.de. It has a couple of English and German videos. You can also subscribe to my YouTube channel, Jens Did, or you look at our website, infosys.uni-saarland.de. See you there!